And I'm also, let me just say this as a caveat, because some of you are listening going, but you have no idea. This has been 40 years for me. This has been this long for me. Well, again, go back to the patriarchs, go back to the heroes of the faith, go back to Hebrews 11 and read their story. Even if I am such an even if girl, I'm like, even if this doesn't turn around, I'm going to choose to trust God instead. Andy, it's so good to see you. Welcome back to the podcast. It's so good to be back. I love seeing you too. Always. It's- <laughs> it's the third time, and uh, every conversation we've had thus far has been awesome. And I would say, uh, folks, listen, we've been talking about this a lot on the show this year, but Andy, we're going to talk about change and transition, mm-hmm. um, and we're going to get under the hood of that. Um, it's a very, very relevant conversation for a lot of people right now, me included. Um, and I'll just start here. Braving change <laughs> is really hard, um, mm-hmm. but because change is inevitable, there's a reframe, I think, we can start with today, which is that our mindsets about change itself often dictate how we navigate through change. I'd love your take on where does that reframe begin? Or even like, what are the underpinnings of setting ourselves up to approach change to begin with? We can go wherever you'd like with that. Yeah, I love that question. It is a big question, but I think for me, where I realized what my lens was has always been in the shaking seasons. A lot of times, right? We love, we love the good change. We love it when like a prayer was answered or things turn around and seem really, really good. But I think when we walk through a shaking or a pruning or a cutting off or a painful season or loss, even if it's one of the things where it's like, God, we cry out for change, right? We're like, God, change my life, change my heart. I want to I wanna become more like you, Jesus. But then he starts to take us down the pathway of change. Very quickly, we find out what we have built our lives on and um, why we view change the way that we do. I think um, even as I start this book out, I mean, the subtitle kind of encompasses the whole book, which is release the past, welcome growth and trust where God is leading you. It's kind of the journey we go on. But um, for me, it kind of hit me in just this major shifting season for me. And even through 2020, which I know none of us love to even say that year, but it was what it was, um, where I realized at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, in Matthew seven, where Jesus has just brought one of the most, the biggest change ushering us in from the, out of the old covenant and into the new covenant. And some of the, his very last words of that sermon are, if you hear these words of mine and do them, then your life will be built on a rock. So when the storms come and the winds come and beat against the house, it's not going to fall down. But if you hear these words of mine, you don't do them then your house is basically going to come crashing down. So good luck, you know? And I think for me in major shifting seasons, the good and the bad, you realize what you built your life on, which also is known as, I guess, our our lens. (laughs) So that's that we can just start there and then you can ask whatever you want from that. (laughs) Mm, Love that. So, okay. So here's a place to spring off and just fresh or fresh questions are are, are coming to mind. I'm walking through something and have been for a while that I've just come to realize, oh, this is what St. John of the Cross would call Dark Night of the Soul or Mm -hmm. like um, Janet Hagberg and Robert Gulick in their book, The Critical Journey would call the wall in their stages of of formation. (sighs) When we experience the dark night of the soul, hit the wall, yes, it does oftentimes reveal the foundation and the soul attachments. How do we not through the process of, and I'll use your words, you said shaking, pruning, and cutting off. Mm -hmm. How do we not interpret those experiences and take on a shame narrative Mm. as if this is because of something I did bad? Now, it could be the result of a consequence Mm -hmm. because of poor choices we made historically that have just added up. But for the people listening right now that are saying, I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for the shaking. I didn't ask for the pruning. I didn't get, I didn't ask for the the cutting off. Andy, there's got to be a reframe because I could see a 
little crack for a shame narrative to enter in and then begin to drive our disposition as we navigate through it, which then causes us to what? Hide in isolation. How Mm -hmm. do we just make sure that doesn't happen? Ooh, see, now I'm springing off in a few different directions. So hopefully what I say makes sense. (laughs) The the last time you were on the podcast, I wrote like a 30 question interview. I asked you two or three questions because we got into like the whole inner healing conversation. So I just, I have a sense we're going there today. So let's just go for it. Yeah. Okay. The shame narrative for me, I think the shame narrative is the thing that breaks my heart the most for many of us, for myself included, for my children, for the people that I pastor and lead and and teach is that we all know this, but then we get locked in it still. Shame is the thing that keeps us in the dark. It keeps us actually coming into agreement with the lies, with false belief systems. And so I think this is why um, even, oh gosh, where was it? What was I preaching out of? I think it was Ephesians 5, but it's like, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. Now, that that whole the whole context of that is actually awaken from the things that are shut down and, and, and locked up. Um, awaken from that, bring it out into the light, and actually live within that. Now, so so to the person who's going, yeah, but I didn't ask for my husband to leave. I didn't ask for this person to die. I didn't ask for my trauma to come up. I didn't ask for, you know what I mean? I didn't want to be here. I didn't ask to get fired. I didn't ask, like, I wanted the good change. (laughs) This is the stuff nobody wants. Nobody asks for. And I, I remember being in the middle of a season like that. And this sounds like a super intense, like line. And I don't know what it's like for many of the listeners but maybe you read something or hear something or you feel this nudge from the Holy Spirit. But I remember being in a place where I heard these words, Andy, transition in life can either teach you or you, or it can take you out. Transition can teach us or it can take us out. And then I think what I realized is, okay, so I have to get to a place of acceptance that there is change happening, which means there's a grief cycle too. And then when I do the change always any kind, the good, the bad, the ugly, it always has the potential to bring Christ-like change within us. So the dark nights of the soul, I, I, I've i unfortunately had more than one. And I, I honestly, they are, they are the most difficult seasons, but I look back and I go, I hated that, wouldn't wish it on anyone, but it formed me in a way that I never knew possible. I found Christ in a way I never knew possible. I became stronger than I ever knew possible and I'm flourishing in a way and have things to give to other people that I never could have had I given up or just built my little house on the sand and went, you know, I don't care, (laughs) but it takes work and that's, what's hard too. (laughs) How so? Will you drill down on that? Like to the extent you're comfortable sharing about that because hindsight is clear. Yeah, it, you go. Yep, there's the perspective. But when you're in the middle of it, mm-hmm. and you know, folks, less like we've talked about this here on the podcast, um, Andy, I've experienced significant shaking and loss in every domain of my life all at once, and it's mm-hmm. guttural. Yeah. What do we need to know hmm. about being in it? How do you keep your feet planted? How did you talk, yeah. like walk me through your yeah. one of your own experiences with that? Um, just as a, as an example to folks, Mm, a couple come to mind for me. The first one was a major wake up call for me. I had, sometimes you have no idea, you know, you're walking through a heavy season, you know, a lot's going on, but you're kind of surviving through it. So I'll speak to the heart of those that are like, listen, I know this isn't good, but I don't know what to do. (laughs) And, and sometimes we need that wake up moment that causes us to go, what am I doing? Like, I can't do this anymore for me. One of those seasons were, it was a major season of loss and betrayal. Um, And I was still leading and pastoring a church, like, you know, had to hold it together, show up every week, raise my four kids in New York City at that stage. And um, in that season, I wasn't aware until later, um, I had lost a ton of weight. I had gut issues, found myself in the ER. This is gross. It was for a staph infection, but crazy that what was going on inside of me was coming to the surface. Um, And I remember like I was just depressed 
And I was doing all that I could to do life, wake up, get my kids to school, come home. But there was one time I was lying in bed and it was dark. The shades were closed and my second born walked in and he grabbed me by the hand and he said, mom, are you going to die? And I went, oh my God, like, what am I doing? Lord help me. Like I, so that was like a turnaround moment for me. Now, did it all turn around right away? No. What I realized is I was stuck in a cycle of grief and I didn't have a game plan to get out. And so a huge thing that I talk about in this book is the need to grieve. I mean, even when I wrote that chapter, I know I'm pinging all over the place, but hello, this is all in our life. Like, right. Is that, um, I started to write this chapter. We had just released our firstborn. He had just moved out of the house and I start the grief chapter. And you better believe like, it wasn't just that. It was like, <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for. But I think there there are seasons where we get stuck in part of the cycle of grief. And when, when we don't move through grief, it stores up in our body and it's gonna come out somehow. So at the same time as you're processing and moving through grief with God in the middle of it, you also need a game plan to get out. <laughs> so it's both and now I can, I can talk about either of those, but that was just like one moment. And like I said, there have been, there have been more than one dark night of the soul, um, but that was one where it was a big wake up call. And I went, okay, I need a game plan. I need to bring some people into my world with me. I need to stop laying under this blanket of heaviness. I, I had spirit, soul, and body. I need a deliverance. I need physical healing. Um, does that make sense? Like my whole, my, I needed to be whole spirit, soul, and body. I needed sozo. <laughs> I needed to be completely and totally walking in the salvation that Jesus came to give me. Um, so I needed to operate in a few different places to be able to do that, to move through the changes that I was going through, the loss, the grief, the betrayal at that time. Gosh, there's so much I could do on right now. And I, I wanted to actually stick here for a moment because what yeah. I don't want people to assume is that you saying you needed a strategy means you're going to life hack your way out of this season, no, no. right? Like in other words, we can't change our own hearts. We can't position ourselves for the transformation of our hearts. Mm. Um, we can't make seasons move quicker. We can take matters into our own hands, but it inevitably backfires on us, you know? So like you couldn't, life hack your way out of this season no. you couldn't strategize or gamify your way out of the season so because you knew you couldn't mm. what's your first move yeah so let me jump to a different season um where i was re and i write about this too um where I really wasn't doing well again. We were pastoring, we had pastored through 2020, we were in 2021. And you know, I feel like there's those seasons where you're walking through so many changes, but you have to, you have to keep going. But meanwhile, there's chinks in your armor, you're getting shot at, you know, spiritually, figuratively, all of that. And um, I started having panic attacks at the start of 2021. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like I have done so much work with Jesus. I can't believe that this is happening again. And so I was talking to my husband and he's like, babe, I want you to just give this friend a call. And so it's my friend. Um, and he, he said, I want you to call her and you need to be really honest with where you're at. Cause I love that you're always honest with me, which he's, you know, he's my person, but at the same time he knew he's like, I'm going to need you to call in call in the reinforcements. So I call this friend and you know, those terrifying moments where you're like, so I'm talking game plan here. Don't walk in isolate. First of all, don't be alone. <laughs> don't do this alone. Um, being vulnerable is scary. Um, especially if you're like me, one of my cycles from childhood that I've had to constantly overcome is my vulnerability being used against me. So finding those people, those people that are not going to use that against you. So, um, that can come with trial and error too, but take your time, go slow. If you need to, I shared everything, the things that I would probably not even write about because it's not necessarily for everyone. And this friend said to me, she goes, you know, Andy, thank you for sharing. I want you to know you're going to be okay, but, but we need a game plan to help maneuver you out of this season. And so within that, um, 
I needed multiple things. I needed weekly discipleship with a group of pastors. So that's what I did. I know it sounds crazy, but I was like, I need people that are in the same actual boat doing the same thing as me where we can grow together and where I'm highly accountable. So I did that. The other was my physical body. I needed to start working out and eating better again because that is always like a crash and downfall. But I, I'm going to say a lot of things too, even if you're unfamiliar. And again, if we can dive down wherever, I realized I needed deliverance, spiritual deliverance of um, spirit of heaviness, spirit of fear. There was a lot of things um, I maneuvered through in that. But I also went away to a Christian um, counseling center where spirit filled um, EMDR. I just realized what happened with my panic attacks was it was just trauma that I didn't get inner healing with like the proper way with Jesus. And so therefore I was stuck in a cycle, even though I'm like, okay, I'm so out of that. So I needed to process it properly. So that was my game plan in that season. But here's the deal. You may be like, I don't need any of those things in this season. So this is where you have to go to God and be like, I am struggling with this major change that's happening to me that I didn't ask for, or even you could be getting married and asked for that or having a baby and asked for that. But you're like, this change is wild. God, I need help to move through this well and do it well. Your game plan is going to look different seasonally. So understand the rhythm of grace that you're walking in and then bring the right people in where you can't see and you have blind spots and then actively do the plan. Um, but again, like you said, you can't like five step your way out of this because it's always with Jesus and it's going to look different in every season. Hmm. Well, earlier you said, and this is connected earlier, you said that chains and shaking either teaches us or takes us out. Mm -hmm. What determines the experience, whether or not we get taken out or it teaches us? What, what's the determination or the determiner in us that, mm -hmm. that can swing the pendulum either way? Your level of need for control. Um. <laughs> mm, geez. Okay, say more. <laughs> I hate I, this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um I am um, the older I get the more I'm like good old back to the basics of following Jesus that have like saved me my whole life. And I think all of those seasons where I have not crucified my flesh and walked in the spirit and his resurrection power where I've been like, you know what Jesus, I got this. I have a game plan and I need you to bless it. Um, that is usually when I get taken out because pride comes before the fall, me thinking that I know better, forgetting that God oh. is sovereign and sees like literally the whole picture. Go ahead, jump in. What were you going to say? No, I just like you're, you're poking holes right now and I'm going, <laughs> shoot, I didn't ask for this. Why are you, <laughs> why are you doing this to me, Andy? I haven't seen you in a couple of years. I know. My friend. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. It's good. Uh, but I, I think the times where I realize I have tried to control the narrative, I have tried to make myself look good, I have wanted what I wanted instead of going, oh my gosh, God, what do you actually want? What do you want for me and my husband and our marriage? What do you want for my children? How can I pray? Like whenever I'm like, bless it. Cause this is, this is the whole narrative with change too, that God had to change me. This is why this book is years in the making as I think it was like six or seven years ago. It was like, you know, those cry out on the altar call moments. You're like, Lord, change me, Lord, move this in my Lord. I, you know, here I am, Lord, send me. And then he starts to do it and you're like, excuse me, God, I would like you to do this another way. And that is when, when we're going like this, God, that's where I feel like, and this is in jest, but I feel like God's like, okay, well, good luck. <laughs> so I think daily we have to surrender. Daily we have to walk in obedience. Because some of us are also like, well, God, I can't cure you. Well, maybe that's because the thing he asked us to do years ago, we were disobedient in, and we're looking for a fresh word. And he's like, I gave you one, but you never did it. So... <laughs> The conversation with Andy Andrew today, folks. You can head to the show notes now. I'm kidding. We're not done yet. It's over. <laughs> it's over. 
<laughs> Andy, where's Paul? I want to talk to Paul instead. Okay, I'll go get him. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I, okay. This is so important because, and the reason I'm jesting about this is because all of us, okay, whatever. I'll put myself on the chopping block. I think my greatest fear is the fear of losing control. So what yeah. do I do? What do we all do? We, we wrap our arms around circumstances so tightly. And so when we're in this place and you're realizing here it is now this is the the, the place i want to explore a little bit because mm -hmm. so many people are like yeah i know i probably need to release the fear of losing control yeah. my, my my controlling tendencies whatever except for the fact that life has told me people aren't trustworthy and dare i say maybe the lord's not or at least my my perception of him is that he's not now we know truth is that he does not change we know that all deficiencies are on our side of the equation so there's a reframe that has to happen a change of heart uh, where the hardened heart is healed but underpinning this whole thing of control is one word and it's trust so like yeah. When we've experienced repeated or even like chronic setbacks, Andy, wrapping mm -hmm. our minds around the idea of trust and letting go of control seems like a total pipe dream. So how do we how do we weave that into the challenge and how do we relearn his character, his nature? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about a scripture like Hebrews 13, 5. He says, I will not, I will not, no, never, not ever leave you or forsake you. And. The reason I said it like that is is that's close to the amplified translation. And basically you get in, like if you have a, a Greek interlinear, um, it will show that in the Greek, it's a quintuple negative. Whereas in the wow. English, the double negative cancels the negative, but not so in the Koine oh. Greek. Because in the Greek, the quintuple negative, five is the number of grace. The quintuple negative says, I am doubling down on the fact that no matter what you see, I refuse yes. to leave my place of leadership and lordship in your life. And yet adversity is really, really loud. And it challenges yeah. our ability to perceive the steadfast faithfulness of the one who said he'd never leave us or forsake us. So Andy, we got to reconcile this because a lot of people are saying, listen, okay, I'm already freaked out by change. So my neurobiological reflex is to hunker down and create a small, safe world, except for the fact that that's not healthy. And <laughs> I'm struggling with trust. Like yeah. pull the thread on this, Andy. What do we do? Oh What's my the first gosh. Step? Yeah, I love that you talked about Hebrews too, because isn't it Hebrews 11 where he goes through all the patriarchs and all the, you know, fathers of the faith and everything that they believed for and never saw. And, and even that is like one of the hardest things to read, but one of the most inspiring things to read, understanding like we stand with this great cloud of witnesses watching us going, hey, we get it. <laughs> We, we believed and trusted God, even when we didn't see fulfilled what we, we thought we would see the Messiah. We didn't see the Messiah. We thought we, you know, so I think, you know, that's meta, but when you're saying, how do we trust God when you're right? I was, I giggle. Cause like either people are going to hate this book and it will flop because they're like, I don't want to read that book like about braving change. No, like, I want everyone to get 10 copies of this and give them away <laughs> because change is inevitable. Yeah. And, and you give us a brilliant blueprint. So just. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm hoping to give a good field guide. But it's let me, super good. Let me give an illustration here about Great. trust. Great. I, one of my best friends, I'm 45. And so is she. And she has never been married. And uh, just recently, she's been moving through just some healing that she didn't even realize she needed. And. Oh my goodness, it all had to do with trust and holding on to her own life. And she still wants to be married, still want like all of those things are hope that she has. And I think about how I have watched her. Like literally, I knew her before I met Paul. I met Paul. She's been through every child. Like she was there at the birth of my last one. Wow. You know what I mean? Like we've done life together. Yep parallel, but totally differently. And I've been believing for her and she's been believing for me for different things. So how, how do we trust? Oh my goodness. Um, actually, I feel like you asked multiple, I heard multiple things and I know I bounced to Hebrews 11. Then you're asking how to trust, but I, I am watching her at 45, almost 46 years old, like sit with me and go, Hey, I need more healing and I didn't even realize that I did. And I don't want to keep going like this. 
And so I think a lot of times with change and braving change and trusting God is going, God, I, um, it's, it's once again, it's moving through grief. Sorry. I'm, I'm getting to where I want to go. Yeah. You're great, Andy. It's this point at which we allow ourselves to grieve what we thought life would look like. This is where I think a lot of times we're not honest and that's why we can't trust. We're not honest with ourselves. We're not honest with God. And a lot of times what it has to do with is we're striving after this, this thing that we thought our life would look like, but we need to get to a point where we go, like we weep and we well and we mourn and we go, God, I did not think I would be here at this stage of my life. And I lament the fact that my life looks nothing like I thought it would. Or, God, this was the dream. I just laid down this dream and and buried it and it's dead. And I I am angry and I'm sad and I have so many, but we don't do that. One of the biggest things I tell people is scripture says he comforts those who do what? He comforts those who mourn. And I think sometimes our assignment is to actually do that, is to close the door to our room and just tell either your roommates or your spouse or your children, please don't come in here. It's going to get really ugly and turn on a song that hits you in your heart. And just let it rip. I mean, there's a reason to why in scripture, I mean, they use sackcloth and ashes. Their funerals were loud. They, you need to have a funeral for some things in your life and you need to move through the grief so you can get to a place of acceptance and then be able to move through it. But I think we get stuck in, we get stuck in grief, but we also get stuck in what we thought life would look like. So we cannot move forward. Okay. This is, this is. Again, oh my gosh, I was looking forward to this so much because this is just how our conversations have gone. Okay, so you're talking about the um, really the body, soul, spirit engagement in the process of grief, mm -hmm. the deep, deep anguish. Um, there's a book called The Transformation, which I'll put in the show notes, folks, by Dr. James Gordon. He's a medical doctor, lives in New York, and he talks about deep deep sorrow wailing tears shaking dancing whatever like mm -hmm. the movement of the body in mm -hmm. releasing trauma from our physiology and so hearing you say that i'm going wait a minute um andy i i based upon what i've been walking through um i have found myself three minutes from tears most days and yeah. it's weird because i'm like it, it it feels a little manic, actually. It's not, and I don't mean to take that word lightly at mm -hmm. all. I'm just saying, like here I am going through my day, and all of a sudden these tears just start running through my body and or out of my out of my uh, eyes, and I'm going, "Where did this come from?" You you and Paul will remember this. There's this old Daryl Evans song. So I was in my kitchen a couple Saturdays ago, and um. The song is called How Deeply I Need You. Um, mm -hmm. Here's my heart. Lord, I lay it before you. Here's my life. Um, where else could I go? What else could I do? And I'm like, I hadn't heard this song in 20 years. And it wow. came out of me and sobs. And I'm going, oh, where? And it's been healing and hard. Where in my physiology has grief been stored to such an extent that I from a programming standpoint, have not even known how yeah. to move forward in this area of life. Or it's all, this is all new and fresh. And so hearing you say that, I'm going, whoa, maybe we need to take an honest look at how we're all stuck in areas of grief. Yeah, I... Spend some and, time on that. Yeah, and all of us, and this is a thing, have grace for yourself too in this, because all of us store up grief differently. I mean, even in the scenario of a family of, you know, children who lose a parent, all of them are going to react differently. You know, the eldest is most likely going to be like, I've got it. Like, I'm in charge. Like, I, you know, the second one, you know, that's me. It's probably going to be all emo. And then the third, you know, but you have, you have all of right, the we ways. Grew, we grew up in the 90s. We can say that. <laughs> yes, I can say it. I, and I I tend to be that person. So oh. my family, I am the crier in the family yeah, and they're all too. like, 
seriously, why do you cry about everything? I'm like, I don't know. I just, I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. <laughs> um, so I think about how, think about how you respond to circumstances. Are you the person who has made vows and said things like, well, I don't cry. I'm not a crier. I'm not going to cry or right. Like, so you like, I've got to be tough. I've got to hold it together. I've got to maneuver through chances are like you are running the show, but you need to go cry somewhere in the car. It's going to come out probably for, in anger for you in some way, shape or form. Um, and a lot of times anger, I mean, anger is a secondary emotion. There's always something underneath anger, right? <laughs> and, and so for me, sadness and hurt and pain are always underneath my unleashing of anger. That's usually when I'm angry with my family, I'm like, hmm. I probably need to go be alone and figure out why I'm yelling at everyone. Often it's grief. There's something I need to grieve and let go of. And so um, that what you were talking about with the tears, I just want to say this. There is a reason why God made our bodies the way that he did, because he knows how to bring healing within our body. Tears actually are healing. First of all, he bottles them up because he has empathy and mercy and his heart is for us. But at the same time, he knows that as we release them, have you ever felt that way? You have a good cry and then often you need to go to sleep, <laughs> but it's because your body is recovering from the grief. So, um, I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> it, oh, it is. Yeah. Anything else like data that you've seen on the, the, the physiological power of, of tears and releasing tears? I know stress hormones are contained mm -hmm. in tears. I thought about something when I was writing my book, actually, because um, I love Psalm 56, verse 8, that he stores our tears mm -hmm. in his bottle. And you know how Jesus, um, as well as Isaiah, both talking about shaking the dust from our feet, yeah. shake yourself from the dust. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking, okay. Because we serve a God who is redeemer. And I know this may sound a little poetic and whatever, guys, just chill. <laughs> Y'all chill. Stay, don't, don't turn the podcast off. I'd like to propose, because he wastes nothing, that the tears that he has stored in his bottle, he mixes with the dust, the adversity of life, and it forms clay that the potter uses oh. to fit and form a vessel fit for the master's use. He wastes oh nothing. And I just, I have had this picture of him taking that bottle of tears and Lord knows he's got a Home Depot bucket for me. <laughs> and, and he pours that on the dust that I've shaken off of my life. And he goes, here's now clay. Wow. And I, the potter, will form a vessel fit for my use. That will be a vessel of honor. It will be fashioned and formed because I am a God who redeems that which the enemy caused for evil. I will use for my good. And I'm like, this is where I look to heroes of the faith like Joseph, uh, like Daniel, like Esther, uh, like Genesis 49. And J here's Joseph. He's walled in and skilled archers aimed at him, but his branches ran over the wall. And this is like Colossians 1. I call you to bear fruit in all, th all things and all seasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, Andy, could this be? Could this be the, the power of the testimony of when we step into grief, when we choose to mourn, we actually receive the comfort that he has designed for us. And we never will receive it until we fully step into mourning. Yes. Well, Isaiah 61, this is the story. So we love the beginning of Isaiah 61, right? Where we're like, spirit of the Lord God is upon me. In our strong times, we love to pray that. You know, that was about Jesus and his messianic, messianic like purpose, but also that now that's on us. We can, we can prophesy that, preach that. But what does it say? He gives us beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of what? Praise for a spirit of heaviness. And I tell you what, like that is the picture I've watched. You were talking about movement of your body, crying movement, like shaking, like shaking the dust off your feet, even shaking, shaking the dust off your body. Um, there's a reason why it's a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, because when heaviness comes upon us, which we've all had a spirit of heaviness upon us in different seasons of life, imagine it like literally as a prophetic picture or a picture that you can see where God comes and takes that, that cloak of heaviness off your shoulders and whatever that garment of praise looks like in your mind's eye, he puts that on you. But think about when you sit like, you know, with your arms crossed during praise literally a praise song, whether that's in your house, in your car, or in church, as you gather with the saints, you sit there, 
But then if you just start like moving that knee and like raising those hands and shaking your body and moving your body. Maybe, maybe for some of you who are like, I don't like this. I will never do that in church. Please don't ask me to be a crazy person that dances around. I'm okay. Try this at home alone, put on a praise song. And when you don't feel like it, begin to praise him and watch what happens. Some of my greatest breakthrough has come when I have been sad and heavy where the Lord's like, get up, get up. And I'm like, no. (laughs) And I literally turn on a song and move my body around my house and hope to the Lord that nobody's looking in the window because they'll be like, what is happening in there? But it shifts something in me. So it's, there is like, again, God knows what praise does. God knows. Does that make sense? It's like all of those things that are antithetical to what we feel like doing, but letting ourselves go there could be the change that brings you through. Well, and and this expands to a broader subject matter, which we don't have time to poke into, which is like a theology of worship. Because Mm -hmm. when we read in the Psalms about lift your voices, clap your hands, shout unto God with a voice of triumph, uh, worship the Lord with dance, with song— with loud instruments, there's something that happens, I believe in our bodies in the Mm -hmm. engagement of, of, uh, of obedience to him. I'd like to propose again, we don't have time to really double click on this a ton, but those aren't helpful suggestions like, eh, do it if you want. I'd like to say that to your point, there is something innate in our, in our makeup as beings that when we, involve our whole spirit, whole soul, whole body in encountering the Lord will experience him in a new and a living way. Yeah. I I would say that too. And this is even from perspective of, you know, prayer sessions with people um, and sitting with, you know, whether that's in a team prayer or when you're, uh, when you're um, praying over a group of people, hungry people are usually the ones that change. (laughs) And Um, even just sitting with someone recently and I was like, do you want to be free? And the person was literally like, not, not really. And I was like, okay, well, I'm probably not going to lay hands on you and pray for you or come alongside you if you don't want it. But that's the other question too. That's where we have to be honest with ourselves. It's like, am I actually just staying here or do I want to move through it? Do I want do I want to go to war? Because worship is also an act of war, like hoisting up a banner <laughs> and going into war. Like there's all of these things that it causes us to like wake up to ourselves But when we're hungry and feeding on the right things and going, I don't know how to change God. I don't know how to be transformed in this. I don't know how to stop feeling depressed, but I want to be. So show me he will. <laughs> so true. Yeah. Okay, so behind all of this, I'm thinking about uh, a core motivator, and I think it's fear. Um, Mm -hmm. You talked about fear a bunch in your book, and you use this brilliant example of childbirth in regard to change (laughs) and transition. And I love this part because I will never in this life uh, or ever, ever experience childbirth. (laughs) Um, But you wrote – so this is what fascinates me from your perspective as a mom of four – Mm -hmm. You wrote that fear slows labor down and can even bring it to a stop. I'm really fascinated by like unpack that as a principle Mm -hmm. for us and take us into whatever level of uh, description you'd like. Yeah. So for the guys listening, don't worry. I won't won't go to (laughs) terrifying places. So I just want to preface that. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought that would be helpful to know. So you don't push stop there either. Um, So I was always fascinated by labor and delivery because my mom is a birth and postpartum doula. So I um, always like talked about birth and like uh, being pregnant without fear. So I never had fear surrounding that where I didn't realize how many women are locked up and afraid of, um, of giving birth. Right. And, um, a lot of times we educate ourselves more about getting our driver's license than we do one of the biggest moments of our life as women. So I, first of all, was like, I want to learn what my body is doing so that I'm not afraid when it starts to do what it's doing it's gonna hurt really badly. And, um, what I learned and what I have seen and what my mom has seen and scientifically, this is proven as well. Um, 
when there is fear in the room, when, when doctors use fear, when they're like, this is going to be very bad. We need to do like your body starts to lock down. And so there are, but if you have someone who's like, you are made for this now, there are, you know, extenuating circumstances where yes, of course, like somebody's body, there's many women listening that had emergency cesareans. Like, so I understand once again, let me preface this. There are many different scenarios. I'm talking about in a perfect, like perfect labor delivery. Um, it, if you understand what is happening with your body and you're like, no, this hurts, but I know my body is meant to do this. I will move through the pain. I will breathe through it. And in the middle of transition, because transition is the worst part, I can do five minutes oh, apart. Geez, Andy. Like, you know what I mean? I can do five minutes apart. Like, yeah, that hurt, but I'm good. But when those trans, those, those um, contractions are literally, you have one, you think you're going to have a breath, and then you have another one, and then you have another one, and then you have another one. That's what the pain of transition in life feels like, where you're like, I can do a little bit of pain here and there. I can maneuver through this. But the moment you start to go, this is too painful. You start yelling at your husband. You start yelling. You're like, you guys, you did this to me. Give me all the drugs. I hate you. I can't do this. That's what we do in the transitions of life. We start screaming and yelling because it's painful. The pain, the, the hits just keep coming. But then what we don't realize is we're not going to remain there forever. That mm -hmm. is not how it is. And but then so all... many people think we will. They're yes. like, I'm screwed. Yeah. That is, and that is what we do. And we have to remember, it's like, okay, guys, seed time and harvest. As long as the earth remains, there are seasons. So why do we believe that we will be in hell on earth forever? Like our God is a redeemer. We can move out of things. Yes, it is. That divorce was painful. That betrayal was painful. The sickness that you're going through is painful. The pain from your childhood that's coming up right now, it sucks. But our God is a redeemer and healer. And in as in childbirth, when you don't give in to fear, but you lean into the pain and you move through it, I kid you not, if you move through transition and you allow yourself to go with it, it feels like seconds later, you are holding that baby in your arms and you're going, ha, huh, let's do this all over again. Like the endorphins, like the oxytocin that runs through your body. It's like God knew what he was doing. But all I'm saying is it's the same. It's the same in spiritual, physical pain that we walk through. But there is a redemptive story. And I'm also, let me just say this as a caveat, because some of you are listening going, but you have no idea. This has been 40 years for me. This has been this long for me. Well, again, go back to the patriarchs. Go back to the heroes of the faith. Go back to Hebrews 11 and read their story. Even if, I am such an even if girl. I'm like, even if this doesn't turn around, I'm going to choose to trust God instead. Where'd you learn that? Because <laughs> that's I... not something you just choose and go, I'm going to decide to do. Well, I mean, yes, we have to involve our will and intention and we, we activate the choice. But like yeah. that comes from a steadfastness of spirit. I'm curious where you learned that, how you developed that. <laughs> um, how I developed that is probably an interesting story that I need my parents to like write a memoir, even if five people read it but probably watching their story. Um, so my parents should not be married. Um, again, like this is a whole book that I'm like, I don't even know if I can write this because of permissions, but I'll tell their story, which it can be told. Part of their story is, you know, my parents were hippies that got saved in, um, you know, the Jesus people movement. They were there when love song, all those guys were playing. They were in the tents in California, all of it. That's their story. They got saved. They were wild hippies. Like their life was, you know, going great. But then they got, um, you know, sucked into, they went back to where I grew up in Washington state. And basically I was raised in a cult where the women were abused, the men were controlled. And when I look at my parents' story, and I won't share too much, but you can read between the lines, like they honestly shouldn't be married. And even biblically don't have to be. Does that make sense? Like I, it was sure. a mess. Yep, so sure. I grew up in that, but then I watched my parents like continue to maneuver through that. And that was my whole upbringing. So, and then even after I left, I, I got saved. I moved to Australia, met my husband. Like there's like a whole story there of redemption. But my parents chose each other. 
They chose to walk in redemption and they're still married and they are, they are the even if people. I have learned it from watching two people where all the odds were stacked up against them. And I think some of it's a learned behavior. Some of it is how I've watched God move in my life. And honestly, I think for me, when I met Jesus, maybe it was just different than everybody else. Like, cause it's individual for everyone. I really encountered and met a love that revolutionized my whole life. And I want nothing else. Even in, it's like what you were saying, where mm -hmm. else would I go? Where else? <laughs> That's right. So I don't know if that answered the question. No, it does. We all come to places in our lives where, again, all of the soul attachments are stripped away. And yeah. what is left is the foundation upon which we have built our lives. And in your case, it's the rock whose name is Jesus. And yeah. when the rains come, when the winds blow, you're standing on a rock. And so I, that it definitely answers my question. But and I know we got to begin the descent of this conversation. Um, I'm thinking about something, and it is this, because when you were talking about the pain of childbirth, you said something quickly, and I, I wrote this down in the form of a question. Is pain or transition the only and necessary way by which the new thing that the Lord wants to do actually is birthed in our lives? Isaiah 43, he says, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. And he asks this question. Do not perceive it. In other words, we might not. <laughs> we might not. That's why yeah. Jesus in Luke 4, um, well, Mark's account actually, uh, I think, describes it a little better. But Jesus marveled at the unbelief of the people because they mm -hmm. took offense at him. And I'd like to suggest that it is the shaking of transition mm -hmm. like a birth canal. Yeah. That is the only and necessary w way by which the new thing comes. What do you think about that? Am I waxing too philosophical in that? What do you think? No, I think that's biblical. I think when you see any form of change or transformation, it requires some forth of some form of pain. So even Israel, they had to leave everything they knew, even though it was slavery, they still had meat pots, they had food, they were cared for, they had their own land. But God was like, well, I have something better for you. And it's a promise. And they're like, okay, they go. And then they're angry the whole time, you know? So there's pain along the way. Um, you look at a lot of the parables that Jesus taught, even John 15, when he talks about, you know, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And our father is a good gardener. And I've already said this, but he cuts off that which is bearing no fruit. And he prunes even the things that are. So the good things are pruned so that they can bear more fruit, which feels very offensive. I'm like, if you God could just oh, sure. like, oh, sure. let my good stuff be good sure. and stop touching it. But <laughs> leave me and, alone. Yeah, yeah. And then Jesus is like, hey, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your own cross and, and do that. So it requires, you know, so, so I think, I think oftentimes our prayers to God once again for change um, I, I talk about this a little bit, but like, we actually need to know what we're asking for, or at least be willing to go. This is what I'm asking for. I don't know what the journey looks like. I lay it all down and I want to trust you, God, because a lot of times we, we resent the cost of what change actually is, even though we asked for it. Often we resent the cost of change even though we asked for it. And so when you get to a place of resentment with how God is transforming your life, you've, that's where you're like, oh my gosh, God, please forgive me. You are a transforming that's God. It. That's right. So, so yeah. <laughs> oh my word. Okay. I'll land the plane here today because I feel like I need another three hours with you. <laughs> you're so awesome. Like I, you're just one of my favorite people to have on the show and our conversations go all over the map, but it's just, it's alive and I'm thankful mm -hmm. for you. I really am, Andy. Um, and I for you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to land here. Y okay. You unpack this brilliant progression in your book um, around the, the theme of inner healing, which I just mm -hmm. so believe in. And you talk about this progression from wounds to lies to false beliefs to strongholds to vows to the manifestation of the false 
self. So mm-hmm. inner healing is such a powerful tool because we are spirit, soul, and body. They are integrated. Um, talk about the component, each component of this progression mm-hmm. and really how this plays out and then train wrecks life. Yeah. If, if we don't <laughs> wrangle it. Well, and this is why I put this tool in here in the book, because if we utilize this tool, you will recognize things for what they are and you can actually do the opposite. So I want to empower people too, right? To to go on that inner healing journey. So wounding happens. Obviously we live in this world where we live in the now, but not yet where Jesus has come to give us life abundantly where the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but he's come to give us life and life to the full. So therefore wounding happens in our life because we live on planet earth and his new kingdom is not fully come here on earth yet. So therefore wounding comes in relationship. It can be yesterday. It can be from a childhood wound. And, and when that wounding comes, that is when the door is opened to a lie. And wounding is like that place where the enemy loves to come in and he'll just sow one seed, a couple of seeds, a couple of whispers of lies. And if we don't combat that lie right when it's planted, it implants itself into our mind, into our heart, into our spirit, it implants itself into our lives and it becomes a false belief system. Now, I want to go back to the lie really quickly. I think it's very interesting that many of us are like, I can't hear God, but we very easily will hear the lies of the enemy. You are created to hear God. So even if you're like, but I can't. Okay, well, read the word. You can hear him. He wants to speak to you. So those lies become false belief systems. Now, false belief system is like a lens that you look through life at. You can go to church. You have a false belief system. You're going to believe everyone is corrupt. You have a lens of a false belief system that men are bad or women are always like this or whatever that is. That's where the false belief system comes in then false beliefs, what does that do? Wounds, lies, false beliefs, strongholds. So we realize, well, the world's not safe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to build a stronghold around me. And many of us, that's different things that can be isolation. It can be rage or anger. It can be unforgiveness. It can, there's so many things where we build a stronghold around ourselves when God is our stronghold. He is meant to be our strong tower. He is the one we're meant to run to. So we build strongholds. We protect ourselves behind these strongholds. And then what we do is we make vows back there behind our stronghold. And we say, you know, I am never going to trust another man again. I am never going to trust the church again. I'm never going to. We make these vows that become stronger than the gospel of Jesus Christ that came to break every chain and set us free. We make these vows instead of making our vows to him. (laughs) And, and we knowingly or unknowingly do this. And then when we do that, wounds, lies, false beliefs, strongholds, vows, and then you find yourself walking around and you're like, I don't even know who I am. You're operating from a false self. You don't know your identity in Christ, but that can be unwound. So all you have to do is when you're wounded or something comes up for you, go, Hey, what happened? I think I feel feel a wound. God, what lie am I believing? And then you just write down what's true. What do you want to give me in place of that lie? And then go, God, what's a false belief system I've been living by? Because of that, you will be blown. It's terrifying. You're like, oh, I've been doing that for how long? God, tell me, tell me a new lens to put on. What's a true belief system I can walk in? You're going to have to, on purpose, put those glasses on. Um, Do you see what I'm saying? So then what you also have to do is with the strongholds you built, you have to actually repent. Say, I repent of protecting myself with rage and anger. I repent and I want to live the opposite way. I want to look at you, Jesus, and follow in your way. And then you have to renounce vows. So I renounce the vow that I can never trust the church again. I renounce the vow. Now, are people fallible and broken? Yes. And will you have to forgive again? Absolutely. But better to make your vows with Jesus than with the enemy. It's just just better. Um, and then you'll find, even if you're limping, you've wrestled with God and you were walking in your true identity, showing at the table as healthy as you possibly can. So there you go. There's the knockout punch folks. (laughs) Yeah. Andy, I mean, this opens up the can to taking on victim narratives, um, Mm -hmm. which I wish we had time today to go there, but I'd love to talk to you in the future about all of that like even yes. to take a deeper dive on the inner healing stuff. Um, but goodness gracious, your new book, Braving Change, is available right now. Links in the show notes, guys. Anything else today, Andy? I'm so thankful for you, so thankful for Paul. I Like I told you, we got to hang out 
um, a few months ago, and he's just he's remarkable. And I just I just admire you both, and I'm so thankful. Oh gosh, he is amazing. I yeah, always tell is. people he is the steady anchor to my roller coaster, and I'm really yeah. grateful. Yeah. <laughs> grateful for him. I think if anything, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else that I want to say? No, I just I I say no, and then I'm like yes. <laughs> just to every listener, you've got it in you to move through this, and our God is a redemptive God. You are stronger than you think. So pick yourself up, swing your feet over the bed. You can do this. Live another day. Walk in his mercy one day at a time. Mm. And you'll turn around a year from now and be like, I did. I braved those changes and God was with me through it all. So just don't give up. <laughs> That's oh, so good. Can yeah. I actually just read one little thing? This is how yeah, I want it. For sure. Yeah. This is who I, yeah. I dedicated the book to. One of the dedications. Listen to this. To the wounded and healing warriors. Hope-filled helpers, dedicated disciples, passionate yeah. peacemakers, and loving yet limping leaders, this book is for you. Stay oh. in the race. Stay in the race, folks. That's where it is. Andy, tell people where to connect with you. Yeah, all of my social media is my name, at Andy Andrew, and that's Andy with an I. Andrew, no S <laughs> and, um, and then just all my stuff, like, you know, yeah. uh, YouTube videos, all that stuff is, um, you can just go to andyandrew.com and you'll find lots of fun stuff there. All my books and you can find my books wherever books are sold. That's right. You're yeah. a gem, my friend. I'm so thankful for you. This, uh, as always with you is just a riveting conversation and I'm thankful for your wisdom. I honor your wisdom mm -hmm. and uh, I just really believe that this book um, and the testimony of your life is is going to make an impact on like the four levels below the surface in a lot of people. It reminds me of like Isaiah 50 verse 4 where he says, I've given you the tongue of the learned to bring mm -hmm. word in due season to those that are weary. And I just pray that over you and I'm thankful for you, thankful for Paul and just bless you guys. I'm I'm so thankful for today. Thank you, Chris. Me too.